everybody. Uh, and, and good to see everybody back here. Um, I have the really great pleasure of introducing the introducer. Um, you know, so uh, from that, I'd just actually like to uh, thank Andre Spicer, uh, who is our uh, relatively new, I can't say new anymore, but relatively new uh, dean here, uh, who is going to then be introducing our keynote speaker, uh, who's sitting down here in front. Um, and you're going to be kind of monitoring everything as well, because session chair includes that particular piece, um, that, that, this particular session also. Um, Without further ado, though, I think I can quickly uh, hand over to you, you so we can keep on schedule. Thank you, Scott. Uh, and it's great to see such intellectual firepower in, the, in this room here uh, every year um, that, that this happens. So I hope you've all been having a fantastic day so far, and the four papers this morning have been insightful. It's nice to see so many of you back here uh, after um, the, the first four conferences. Last year was solely online, uh, and then the one in 2020 was postponed. Uh, so greetings to you all and the online people. So we understand this to be the only uh, academic conference dedicated to the topic of M&As uh, and related subjects. I know, in a way, that's exciting for all of you to be able to see your co-authors, collaborators, colleagues, all in one place without having to search them out through a large kind of uh, conference in a big hotel with nasty-looking carpets, as we often uh, see. I'm sure uh, you'd like to join me in thanking the organisers too, and more, more importantly, the EG, uh, ECGI and also our former Dean, Ola Volpin, here, uh, and um, Tran and Scott Muller. So let's uh, just thank them briefly, I think. <laughs> Carlo, thanks for flying back to the conference. I know uh, it's great to see the continued work and the score going on, and uh, we'll hopefully do you proud. I'm the Dean, so it goes without saying, uh, when asked to speak, I want to tell you all about the good things which are happening at the school. So we, nearly, we educate nearly 4,000, I think it's actually over 4,000 students each year on globally renowned programs across levels of study, undergraduate to master's, PhD in executive education. Uh, on graduating, our students join an alumni community of 50,000 people across the world in 160 countries. Um, we have all sorts of successes that I won't bore you with. But perhaps the one which I'd like to pick out now is our fantastic performance on the research assessment uh, framework. So for those of you outside of the UK, the REF measures research quality. So we came in the top five in the UK. That puts us alongside of London School of Economics, uh, Cambridge, London Business School, um, uh, London, uh, and, and LIC, and I think next to um, Warwick. So what I'm really here to do is to introduce our, um, Giovanni Amodia. Amadeo, sorry, Amadeo, a distinguished keynote speaker uh, from a firm uh, all of you know for their research, which is INO Merger Market. First, I would like to say that this annual conference has played, um, always played home to leading practitioners in industry as keynote speakers, and not just academics. Uh, we, we're, and you'll hear lots about leading from our leading academics today. This parallels and reflects the ethos of our school, reflective of our location here in the heart of London, which links academia and business. Giovanni is also a researcher, so he has a very relevant background for this conference. He manages the global uh, data team for INO Analytics, where he sits on the executive committee. INO Analytics, which was formed in 2012 from a combination of Decalogue and Accurus, is this correct? Dialogic and Accurus. Dialogic and Accurus, which uh, was merger markets as part of the INO group. Among uh, the database of which uh, Giovanni is responsible for are the Dialogics, merger markets, debt wire, perfect information, an information group to name a few, correct? Uh, in his role, Giovanni's team is responsible for producing high quality data that can be used for market, by market participants to effectively make decisions and also many academics use this data as well. Prior to this role, Giovanni managed the global research team of Arcurus where his team was tasked to produce valuable insights using data. Previously, Giovanni managed Merger Market's global team of journalists and his responsibilities included moderating and speaking at m and events and hiring new talent. He also comments regularly about uh, markets on television and gives academic lectures. Giovanni um, joined Acurus in 20, uh, 2001 and was, uh, held a number of positions within the company including the Frankfurt Bureau Tree, Italian correspondent, telecommunications, leisure and media reporter and research analyst based in London. Prior to this, he worked with Commerce Bank in Germany, 
Giovanni studied a degree in economics at the University of Brescia. Brescia. Brescia, sorry. <laughs> and is a member of the um, Journalista Publicista enrolled in the Journalist Corporation Milan. So how do you say this one correctly? Publicista. Publicista, sorry. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a lesson in my pronunciation, which is terrible. <laughs> so, over to you Giovanni. Thank you and let's welcome you. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, having me here. Oops. Maybe I'm not so familiar with the routine. Perfect. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, having me here, and it's a great pleasure. Thank you, Andre, for the introduction. Thank you, Scott for inviting me. And Scott now needs to get your presentation up here. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So I'd like this session to be very interactive. So if at any point uh, you have any questions, please feel free to ask me so. So I am here uh, to give you an overview about uh, M&A, debt trends, uh, SPAC trends, and uh, 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 debt trends. But I want to give you a, earlier an introduction of why the debt is important and how the market participants use that. With me, I have three colleagues, Darren Maharaja, who is going to help us with uh, some uh, data-related questions, if you have so. Marilor Kiruz for any M&A related questions and Beranger Gill for any other uh, questions. So the presentation is divided into four parts. I will be giving you an introduction of, of ION. Then I will give you a background, as I said, why data is important and what can we do with the data. Then I'm going to talk about the trends in the market. And finally, a little surprise before we conclude. Okay, so uh, a few words about ION. Uh, for those who are not very familiar, ION is a privately owned company which is run uh, with the logic of a permanent capital provider. So unlike the private equity firm, permanent capital have a long-term view, so they hold their assets for 10, 15 years and more. Uh, there are five uh, main pillars within ION, and ION, the, the goal of the company is to provide mission-critical software to enable the users, so the clients, to take rational and data-driven decisions to also improve uh, efficiencies and reduce waste. So as I said, there are five main divisions. The first one is uh, ION Markets, and the clients here are the banks, so mission critical software for banks. The second one is ION Corporates, similar logic, similar concept, and the, the clients are the corporate, the treasurers, and so on. Uh, Andre earlier talked a little bit about <coughs> Uh, Ion Analytics, which comes from the combination of the logic and Accuris, and it was formed in 2021. And the two latest acquisitions in Italy, Cedacri and Cerved. One is more focused on the, the banking sector, so processes the daily transactions for the banking sector in Cedacri, and Cerved, which was a, a listed company, and they provide credit information, among many other things. So this slide shows you the journey of a corporate that has grown through acquisition over the last 20 plus years. The reason why I want to show this is just to give an overview of how a corporate operate and why they make acquisition and what is the rationale. So it started providing information, sorry, providing software for the banking space, specializing in the fixed income solutions. So several acquisitions made through the course of the year, having in mind the same client, but different solutions. So you start getting synergies from that. Later down the line, the company acquired, with the same principle, other providers where the clients was a corporate. So within that, then you start learning a little bit about the experience of the banking sector. And then you try to um, get the synergies and, and learning <coughs> from the previous acquisitions. Then the third step was to acquire companies in the data and content sector, 
And again, this, the, the clients are similar. So you can offer banking solutions, you can offer software solution, data and content. And the last one with the recent acquisition of uh, Chedakri and Cerved. Very briefly on uh, the global outreach of uh, ION, the group employs around 13,000 people and is present in uh, over 35 plus countries. And Andre already gave uh, a little bit of presentation about myself and uh, what I achieved in the career. So the first slide I'd like to talk about is the data. So an interesting <coughs> quote is you can have data without information, but you cannot have information without data. The data is at the base of everything. So take, for example, an M&A transaction. That's a data point. You take two, two data points. But taken on their own, they might not mean anything. So you need to start thinking about what kind of insights can I derive from that data. So for example, there could be a record year from cross-border transactions between China and the UK or there has been a record issuance of a high yield bond in a particular region. So then it becomes information. So what do you do with that data? You take that and you compare it with the market. So you say, the data cell is this, what do you hear? What do you feel? What's your pipeline? You combine the two and then you start getting knowledge. With that, you can also start uh, preparing and producing analytics and prediction which then will enable the clients, not just ours, but just in general, to take informed data-driven decisions. If you think about the uh, financial services sector, it was and it is still mainly based on uh, personal knowledge, connections, and so on. But without the data, it's very, very difficult to take strategic decisions. It's a busy slide. But I want, the point I want to make here is that these are the actors in the capital markets ecosystems. And at the bottom, and I'm going to explain it in a second, these are the data needs. So you can look at the slide in two ways, either from left to right or to right to the left. So you start from the investor and you follow the capital flow all the way through the corporate and the companies. I prefer to start from the corporate. So what does the corporate need to do? They might need to do an M&A. They might need to raise capital, issue a bond, or uh, sell a stake, or IPO, or open a new plant, or uh, launch a new product, whatever that might be. So what do they need? So they need capital for sure, but then they also have the advisors that can help them. They can help them structure the transaction, identify potential targets, negotiate the terms. And the same can do the investment bank. Similar role to the advisor, but being a bank, they can lend money, they can potentially promote investment through the roadshow, they can gather all the orders from the investor, and so on. Then you have the lawyers. They are primarily working on the structure of the deal, looking at the regulation, looking at the employment law, and so on. And then finally, you have the investor. Their goal is to deploy the capital with the expectation, of course, to make a return in the future. So let's look and what data each of them need. Going back to the corporate, so they, if they're looking for an acquisition, they need to look at potential targets. Or if they are uh, uh, looking to sell themselves, they need to find out who is out there, there's an appetite for buying in that particular space. Or they need to find out who the competitors are, what they're doing. Uh, are they growing and maybe compared with themselves, they might not be growing. They need to know the multiples, how much is the price being paid. And of course, they need to know the trends. If they need to enter a particular space, is that market, is that region attractive enough or not? Similarly, all the other actors um, have similar data needs. So again, market trends, they need to know where the other advisors are, the same for the banks. And, and similarly to, to the lawyers, maybe there is a little bit of an angle on uh, what are the red flags for the transaction. And then similarly for the investor. So take this, the slide previously here, this one, oops, about the data. And these are the data needs. So now let's look, before talking about trends in the market, M&A, debt, and so on, let's look about what is the macro environment out there. 
So you, you've probably seen so many times in the paper, <clears throat> you look at the treasury bonds in the US and in Europe, after many years of uh, zero returns, now in the US we have 3.5%, in Europe we have 2.5%, and the reason we know this pressure from the war in uh, Ukraine and uh, uh, all the supply chain issues and uh, interest rate and inflation, so you know about this. But on the other side, you have the employment, and especially in the US, the employment, so the unemployment is quite low. And for example, if quoting uh, President Biden, he said, actually, this, this uh, level of unemployment is quite good because it can help us ease all the supply chain issues in uh, sectors, for example, the airlines. And uh, I was talking to someone, and, and they were saying that the earliest they can resume hiring again is in 2025. Digitization, again, it's very difficult to find people with uh, coding skills in the market. Just to give you an example, the population that is digital in the Silicon Valley is the same as the entire population of London, Paris, and Berlin. So there is a massive shortage of talent, and everyone wants to digitize. And again, the low level paid uh, uh, people. Then you have uh, the level of inflation. You know what's happening in the UK, in, uh, in the US, and, and in Europe. And then the, the level of uh, the, uh, the oil, which is putting pressure again on all the other indicators. One thing about the interest rate, uh, Christine Lagarde said in a recent press conference that the goal is to have inflation back to 2%. But if that is not possible in the short term, and there's going to be pressure from the inflation, they will not rule out further increase than one is potentially expected for September. Let's look quickly at uh, the markets, the indexes. So the S&P, at some point, we thought it could have gone up to 5,000, and now we are well below 4,000. The Nasdaq, again, well over 15,000, and now we are below 11,000. So this is all within a year with everything that's happened. But possibly the most interesting indicator is the VIX, which is a short-term uh, index which is linked to uh, how the S&P is going to do within 30 days. It is called the volatility index or, even more interestingly, the fear index. So it looks at how the investors are confident of the volatility in the market. So right now we are above 30. When we reached the bottom last year, around 15. Usually when the VIX goes above 25, there is no more ECM market. So there are no more issues. And the only other times where the VIX was much higher was in 2020 when the pandemic started and in 2008. So, so with all the data, then you have the commentary in the market. So there is overall fear. So Jamie Dimon from JP Morgan, brace yourself, a hurricane. Most Americans feel there is a recession on the way. OK? Can it get any better? So Bitcoin, 21,000, that was maybe 10 day, 15 days ago. So <coughs> CT team downgrades US stock, recession risk favors China. Something on the, on the car sales, again, can you get more gloom? The Silicon Valley braces for tech pullback after a decade of, uh, of decadence. So if you consider all of these, the picture is pretty grim. But on the other side, there might be opportunities. So President Biden said, recession is not inevitable. The US banks maybe are able to go through the downturn. Numbers online. So there is no evidence that there is a recession right now. <coughs> the Euro group chief also made a positive or potential positive um, comment. And here, and this is the only one I've seen actually in the market. So fear of recession will not stop deals, says Center View. Blair Ephraim. So are we going to have M&A this year or not? And there is another commentary from the US uh, Treasury State Secretary uh, Yellen, which said, actually, it's not necessarily that we're going to have a recession uh, this year or, or next year. So again, going back to the previous slides, you take the data, then you look at the, the macro environment, you look at the market, the indexes, and then you look at the comments. So now let's look at. Uh, what the numbers say, M&A. So if you have a look at the 2021 results, 
record year in so many years, and now this is where we are. And if you think of any possible record that uh, we might have had, the number of uh, transactions in China, the number of uh, large deals above uh, 10 billion US dollars, the number of uh, buyouts on the total, the number of, uh, so the, the percentage of private equity deals to the total. That <coughs> was a record in 2021. And now uh, we have uh, a decrease in terms of sectors, technology, of course, because everyone wants to become digital and everyone is hiring to buy digital asset. ESG, of course, is a big topic at the moment. And defense, because of the war, these are the main sectors that are uh, uh, dominating right now. And every part of the M&A environment is weakening, not just one. So is there any question at this stage? Otherwise, I can continue with uh, more uh, data. OK. So let's look at the private market fundraising. <clears throat> this is quite uh, interesting as well, and is potentially linked to the, to the previous slide. So last year, we had the record year in terms of fundraising. So for the entire year, 106 funds were raised, $460 billion. This year, and my Lord, correct me if I'm wrong, is around 40, 45 for less than half. So it's not a terrible year, which is linked to the second point. So the limited partners still have appetite to invest in private equity and venture capital. They want to back all the large funds, but also there is a prolification of uh, new managers that they were bored with a previous job and they want to raise a new fund. And the LPs are backing them as well. Just to give you a figure, uh, in one senior private equity practitioner was telling me that in 2000, when he started uh, his career in private equity, he told me that there were around 1,500 funds. Now, depends what you consider funds, but there are well over 10,000. So what does that mean? There is much more capital in the market flowing. Are there more geniuses in the market that can do that job? Maybe not. Are they all giving good returns? If you go and look at some performances, maybe not, but no one talks about it, so this is a little bit of a, of a provocation. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is all the dry powder, so the, the capital that all the private equity firms still need to deploy amounts to $1.5 trillion. So there is a, a huge amount of capital in the market that needs to be deployed. What does that mean? It means that in the future, we potentially can expect even more large buyouts in the market. And the final point, which is linked to one of the next slides I'm going to say, is about the contribution of the direct lending to the total of the financing. So private credit and private lending is, is on the rise. Then I have two slides on debt capital market and, uh, and loan capital market. I have Darren here with me, which might add a couple of words. But the point of this slide is that, take into consideration everything I said about the macro environment, the inflation, the war in Russia, and, and the pressure on the supply chains, <coughs> this is affecting the bond market and the loan market. So the issuance that we had this year compared to last year have gone down. One question mark is, in certain industry, automotive, uh, airlines, and so on, What's going to happen to all this credit? Are we going to see more distress in the future? That's a question mark. Maybe Darren, you want to add a few things? Uh, yeah, sure. So the debt markets uh, face several challenges this year. One is supply of M&A. So there's two main dynamics that happen in the debt markets. One is refinances. One is the financing of the market. In the last few years, we've seen a huge financing, refinancing. Everyone who's locked in credits have done. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, everyone's good for the next five years. Uh, but there's also a lack of M&A coming through to the pipeline. So bankers are asking themselves, you know, uh, there's lack of deal flow coming through. 
how is this going to affect our fees? Let's say an M&A deal does hit the market, um, issuance is down because banks are also facing uh, other is issues such as rising borrowing costs. Uh, fundraising is falling. So in previous years, last year, we saw record fundraising on the debt side. This year, we've, we don't see anything nowhere, in, nowhere near those levels. So there's a fundraising issue. And then there's a question from investors. So investors are saying, so if you think of a debt instrument as an income generating asset, the investors are saying, why will I buy a deal in primary at 99 cents on the dollar when I can go to the secondary market and I can get it for 93 cents on the dollar? So what that means is the secondary market, there's lots of value there. You can pick up a Sainsbury's or a really good healthcare company rather than go to an expensive primary market and pick up a deal there where not only is it more expensive, but it's also many investors chasing few credits. So these are the, the kind of issues we see now. Then the other dynamic going on is we're moving away from an issuance market into, as Gio said, a stress, distressed environment. Now the distressed, distressed credits, they, they tend to look like corporates that are facing high wages, uh, increase uh, cost of materials such as energy, also supply chain issues. So think of your coffee shops, think of uh, transport industry, airlines, etc. So all these uh, issues going on at the moment, together with macroeconomic events, kind of increase the, as we, as we saw in the VIX, we, we see this nervousness, this volatility in the market this lack of investor appetite. Uh, thank you, that's it for me. And one final thing on the next slide, if you want to say something about the direct lending. Also, the debt markets face uh, increased competition within the debt markets. So what's happened in, let's say, the last global financial crisis was a bunch of bankers were made redundant. What happened to them? They did two things. One set went off and became financial advisors. They kept their clients, their little black books, and they started to advise their clients on debt. The second thing that happened was some of these bankers became fund managers, and they were there to suit the needs of let's what we call the middle market. So banks weren't lending to the mi middle market. These funds were saying, well, we can lend you money instead. Over the last 15 years, they've grown in significance to the point where they are competing to lend money with the bond markets and the loan markets. So these private debt guys, they're, cha they're taking a big chunk of the traditional debt markets for themselves. And it's interesting to see how that market grows even further. Um, they can deploy capital quicker, they can raise capital. They don't have the, the, the public um, uh, responsibilities in terms of reporting as um, the traditional banks do. So it would be interesting to see how that market evolves in the future. What's the interplay between the banks and the private debt funds? Um, and you know, uh, what the effect will be on M&A in the future? Will it be inflationary? Will it cause more competition? Is it good? Is it bad? Thank you. Thank you, Darren. A couple of final slides on, uh, on the data, so ESG. So the issuance is, so the first quarter this year, we saw a similar level to the same quarter last year, whereby we saw a significant drop this, the second quarter to the second quarter last year. However, the, the war is making people think, can we move away from traditional sources of energy to cleaner sources of energy? And there is more attention to ESG topic in the market. And yes, there are challenges, but just to give an example here, Live is a hydrogen producer who was able to complete an IPO. So when the asset is good, there is a market for it. Final slide on the trends, the SPAC. If you remember the, uh, the chart on M&A, this more or less mirrors that. So you had an increase uh, last year, record, whatever you might think about, and now there is no more SPAC. Now, What's happening? There are uh, a huge number of uh, SPAC, 590 more or less, that need to be uh, put to play by Q2 2023. So the investors, what are they doing? They're trying to redeem money, their money back. And there are 
more carrot than sticks. In, in theory, they shouldn't really do it. They should be discouraged. But if they say, okay, I want to get my money back, so they, the manager will say, actually, no, I'll give you an extra performance if you don't redeem your money. So you have that trend as well. What asset are they going to buy? So because what's left now on the market is high-growing company, but they don't generate any money. They are cash burning. Is that a potential viable target? We don't know. So, so these are some of the issues that are surrounding the, the SPAC uh, market. So the last two slides, is a, as I said, is a little surprise, just to show you the impact of the data and the information. So if you remember, Andre talked about uh, uh, that I used to manage the editorial team. So I wanted to show you a case study of a company which said they were disposing of an asset and how the team within merger market and that wire covered that over the last year. So normally you uh, identify a bank to sell an asset, then later on you identify who the players are, the bidders are, what are the issues and so on. So this is the coverage that we had all through the life cycle of the, of the, of the auction. This is a privately or private transaction because it was not on the market, but, and, and I chose on purpose a private situation. But if you were to see a public transaction, you can see every time there is a rumor or a news how the stock price of that particular company is being affected. This is a state-owned company selling a division, and the next one is similar, and then there's the slides are available selling uh, a portfolio company to another private equity firm. Similar concept and similar different coverage. And final slide here on uh, uh, the content reach and credibility for uh, Iron Analytics. And with that, I'm opening the floor for questions. Thank you. Or, yes. yes. <laughs> Probably. Uh, yeah. Oh, hi, Giovanni. Uh, I, I just wonder if you know perhaps the expected um, increase, further increase in interest rates, right, is also affecting you know the appetite of buyers, you know, in the M and A markets, because obviously if interest rates go up, right, and obviously that would affect valuations and potentially, you know, would, so, you know, buyers would rather wait to buy, you know, deals, you know, cheaper than buying now. So I don't know, like, did you see that in your data? It's the early to, to maybe one of my if you want to add something, it's too early to see that yet, but the trends that we saw in the previous crisis is that <clears throat> you are a strategic firm, you can afford to pay in cash because the, the price of the, the borrowing increases. So you have cash reserve and you can use that. And you can also leverage the synergies. So that's one of the trends. If you're a private equity firm, the cost of capital might be more. You might not understand the asset. You might not be able to rea realize the synergies straight away. And then again, goes back to the point I was making about digitization. So all the big businesses need to digitize, but there are no talents out there. So are you a private equity firm? Okay, who's going to do that for you? Okay, you might have one person in the firm able to do that, two, three. But then <clears throat> do you have enough professionals that can do that? So that's another challenge. So I think it's a bit too early to say, but this is the trend that we observed in the past. <coughs> Great. Any other question? Yeah. So I'm wondering how the data gathering process, sort of at the very bottom of your charts, how that has changed in your company over the last, let's say, 10 plus years or so in light of new technology and everything else. So how does the model work differently now? How much less, whatever, shoe leather do you do now? How much more is automated? How much is, whatever, I don't want to say AI, but something in that direction. So okay. how, how, how have things changed? Yeah, so a very interesting question. So when I started, so I started in 2001. The company was funded at the end of 99. <coughs> and uh, we used to print all the deal announcements. So there was only merger market. There was no debt or no other product. So merger market was the first one. We used to print the deal announcement, go and read it, and then uh, 
underline everything that was relevant, then take the information, take it into the system, validate it manually, and so on. So now, the majority of the validation takes place automatically. There is a person that goes and makes sure that this is done properly. There was no uh, automated ingestion of the data. We buy now, not everywhere, but we have web crawler and then also automatically uh, some of the data gets pulled into the system. So again, we are a long way from being completely automated and, and the issue is capital resources, human talent. So we have a team of data engineers in my team that does that, but it's not enough to automate the whole process. Okay, great. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for this fantastic presentation. One of the most interesting things was this uh, the decline of the SPAC. So would you say that we're witnessing the death of SPACs at all, or, or do you think that these are going to sort of stick around for, for some time, uh, but at a lower level? That's a very controversial question because um, I was thinking that last year, but I didn't dare saying that uh, we're not going to see any more sparks. And now we're not going to see any more sparks. The question is, what's going to happen to those 590 sparks that uh, still need to deploy capital? I think everything will depend on that. If they're going to be finding, or the majority will find targets, and maybe I think we can see more sparks in the future. If not, <clears throat> it might be difficult. But the other thing is, that industry it has no memory. All the disasters were made by financial investors in the past. Do people remember? No. So if it's not going to be Spark, it's going to call something else. But instruments like that will pop up in the future. Yes. Yeah. So you're, you're primarily a data provider. I have a question following up on the SPACs. What is there, is there purchasable, purchasable data for us academics, or do you provide any data on these, uh, whether it's a, SPA, a SPAC uh, redemption period at two years, or if it's a PE lockup? Because I shouldn't admit this, but I want to write, write a paper on kind of dollars chasing deals and how time horizons can affect investment behavior, right? So if I'm coming up on my two years, I need to make a deal, or I, I don't get that big fee. Similarly, VCs often have 10-year lockup periods that they can extend. I haven't found good data on any of this. Yeah, we have the data, so we can talk about it separately. All right, and if anyone wants to co-author. I'm not taking any commission here, but yeah. Yes. Thank so you. Do we have questions? Yeah. Giovanni, two, uh, two questions, so you can take them in either order that you want. First, following on the first question, one of the real challenges we have using data is that it keeps on changing. So I'll use a data set that um, you know, I will pick up in January, and when I go back to the identical data set with the identical criteria today, it's different because you've updated the database. Um, you know, very, very difficult. What's being done to fix that is a question, uh, if you're doing anything, or maybe you don't care about it because you just figure that it's then the most current data all along. Second question, you didn't mention IPOs. You didn't show a chart on IPOs. And there's a strong correlation between the IPO and M&A market, where the M&A market tends to follow IPOs by about nine months, plus or minus a bit, depending on what cycle you're in. Uh, given that IPOs have dried up, that would say something about the M&A market, at least large cap M&A coming in the future. So I'm just wondering about uh, any comments you have on the IPO market. So sure. just those two questions. So I'll let uh, the IPO question uh, for Marie Lor. Maybe you want to start with that? Yes, first. Um, thank you. Maybe come closer. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. It's cute to do exercise. <laughs> OK. Um, so for the IPO market, I mean, F, as has been mentioned before, it's this, uh, this trend has really dried up. We've seen very few uh, issuances, especially compared to last year, which was a peak record year. So there's really not much to say about this, apart that they're really struggling. And um, even when you look at the PE exits, the activity has decreased a lot. And when you see like the breakdown of exits in PE firms, IPO, which used to be like one of 
you know, quite uh, popular exit. It has, it has also uh, decreased a lot, and uh, PE firms are, you know, they're they're more they're going through uh, second bar, bar, second drop, se sorry SBO, so secondary buyouts and uh, trade sales. So yeah, it's a very challenging market at the moment with like very few issuances on the IPO. On the first question about the methodology of the data, maybe Marie Laura, maybe can add as well. The way it works, we have a process called reconciliation. So we reconcile the data with our the banks, the law firms, and so on. So the snapshot that you might have in January might be different from the one in March because we verify the data with the banks and the lawyers. So we integrate what we had in January at the end of the quarter. Now, the value of the transaction should not differ significantly. We have them in real time. The number of uh, maybe small unadvised or unannounced or uh, undisclosed transaction might differ. Is that a fair description? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we can take the last question. Uh, yes. Hi, it's Enrico here from Silk. Um, just on, on continuing the conversation on IPOs, we not covered carve out or delisting. An example is Cervet, obviously from Ion. I think about Morrison supermarket, CDNR. So what's the trend on that and how it's going to affect? And more importantly, after a PE does a delisting, what's the strategy in your view? Okay. Amen. Sorry, can you, I, I'm not sure I, yeah, your we, question. We, we are covering, and no, now. Today, 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 I'm saying, I Yeah, as I mentioned before, I think the IPO is the least favorite exit. I mean, because it's not um, it's, it's not a, like an ECM market at the moment, and they're favoring you know SBOs, so secondary buyout. So it's like if you want the exchanging, like the portfolio companies are exchanging between themselves. So they're going, they're they're selling to themselves, like PE firms are selling to PE firms. Um, so it's staying in the private market. So it's either this or uh, trade sales as well. So there is still space for uh, all the buyouts that we observed for another management buyout or a, another secondary or tertiary. I think company, uh, private equity firms are realizing more and more that, that that's a route that they should continue doing. Yeah. Okay, great. I think we can give a round of applause to our uh, keynote speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Giovanni, for the great insight, and uh, thanks for his colleagues. And uh, now let's come back uh, to all the papers. Uh, my name is Zhong Chen. I'm uh, from King's College London, and I uh, will be chairing this session. Now let's welcome uh, Stephen Obenberg from uh, Erasmus University to present his paper uh, on the, the uh, post-merger integration. Um, uh, post the merger restructuring of uh, the labor force. So uh, thanks again to the organizers for organizing this conference, a uh, great conference, and thanks also for having us on this conference. Um, the paper I'm going to present is about the post-merge restructuring of the labor force, and it's uh, joint work with Peter Gerke, Ernst Mauck, and Christoph Schneider. So, just no. yeah, okay. Um, so 
basically, we are trying to get at an almost ancient question in the AIM and A literature, that is how the firms uh, realize synergies in mergers and acquisitions from a completely different perspective. So historically, I think a lot of research has been done, rightfully so, on uh, analyzing stock returns around the announcement of acquisitions. Uh, so you would look at abnormal returns and then regress those, for example, in firm and deal characteristics, what you call the ex-ante setting. Um, we also know by now um, quite a few things about the ex-post setting. So we know that um, acquisitions reshape the boundaries of the firm. So there are planned closures, there are divestitures, um, patents do get acquired and they get basically patent portfolios get merged together uh, to combine with R&D activity. And so we want to add to this literature uh, the human side of things. So simply put, we, we start out with a very broad research question, which is how do firms restructure their labor force after mergers and acquisitions? So we are interested in, so really disentangling the flows between the target and the acquirer. We want to know what are the flows between those two, inside and outside of the labor market, and how do these flows change the composition of the labor force. And adding to that, we also want to understand how uh, managerial capacities in, in the acquirer and so the organization of labor plays into that. For analysis, we have a theoretical framework in mind. So a lot of the analysis is also purely descriptive. Um, and so the idea is that so we want to perceive what's going on from the perspective of Levine, who argues that uh, M&As create value by basically combining two intangible assets. So on the target side, that would be a business opportunity. That's how we call it, and it can be uh, anything from a, a growth option uh, like R&D or patents to um, for a synergy potential like consolidations. And so that would be the one intangible asset. The other one would be um, a skill of the acquirer to realize these opportunities efficiently. Uh, now, so, so that's basically the argument in Levine. And so what we think still open a bit is what these skills of the acquirer really are. Now, so this is where we try to chip in and argue that so basically the ability uh, to realize synergies uh, stems from a superior and of human capital perspective. So from having uh, a workforce uh, that is uh, better managed uh, and better organized and also is uh, superior in terms of its skill set. And so I'm going to spell that out in more detail later. Um, so, but you're arguing that this has basically uh, big implications for post-merger restructuring because so to leverage uh, its human capital, so for the acquirer to leverage its human capital and its organization, the acquirer will have to move and reconfigure a lot of jobs internally. So before I give you the details, just let me wrap up the paper in a nutshell. Um, so what is it that we do? So basically, so this is German data. So we go to Borough van Dijk Sief here, download all mergers and acquisitions for Germany from 1997 to 2014. Um, then we go uh, uh, and add the German labor data. So we, we work with census data from the Institute of Employment Research. So we have access to, all, uh, to basically all employment records of all employees in Germany. And from that, we build our employment and labor flow data. And then we run uh, difference and difference analysis, plain vanilla, on a matched sample of control acquirers and targets. So in total, we end up uh, having 1,043 transactions, which means we also have 1,043 acquirers, 1,043 targets. And we also have 1,043 control targets and 1,043 control acquirers, allowing us to have basically synthetic merge, merged firm pairs uh, to, to account for that. Now, so we cannot argue that we are the first to look at the human side in M&A, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but I think, so we add a few things to this discussion which are very important. And the first, and uh, I think most notably one, is that we do not just look at the target and what happens to employees there, but we look at the merge firm, so also the acquirer. And that allows us to, uh, as you will see in a minute, to see much more of what's going on. And it allows us also to disentangle job flows from employee flows. And on the, along the way, I think we also produce a lot of novel stylized facts. 
So what do we find? Um, this is just a preview. Um, what I found very surprising is target employment really halves. So a lot of employment is lost at the targets. At the same time, the acquirer actually grows in employment. So they uh, build up new jobs over there. And so while this happens, uh, a lot of target employees still leave the merge firm. So the jobs move over to the acquirer, but the target employees, they do not. And so that is because the acquirer seems to have a preference for people from the external labor market. Now, when you look at inflows and outflows, you also see that the inflows uh, that are coming in, these people have different characteristics from the people that uh, go out. Okay, so the results. So the first set of results. Um, the setting that we use is a difference in difference. So, um, so this regression is um, basically standard in the slide of literature. We, we regress a growth rate, which is already a difference on uh, a set of controls. So we have um, the pre-acquisition employment growth, parametric and non-parametric controls, time fixed effects, and then we have a treated, a treated indicator which gives us the second difference. And so all the results I'm going to show you uh, in the next few slides, they will always relate to this theta that you see here in red. So um, the big picture. Uh, here you see how net employment after acquisition develops. And for the merge firm, so around 7% of the labor force is, is being lost. Um, and then you break that down into target and acquire, you see that more than half of the target's labor force is, is actually lost. And at the same time, the acquirer grows in employment by around 15%. Now, so these numbers, um, so at the beginning of this project, we had a hard time of figuring out what would be the right way to scale this and to understand the dimensions. So, um, so these are the numbers that give you basically the results scaled per each entity by merge firm, target, and acquirer. But so from now on, um, to, to make things more comparable, we also we scale everything by the merge firm. So now these numbers add, add up. So the 7% in employment loss, they uh, can be broken down into an employment loss of 40% of the total, la total labor force in the target and a growth of 7% in the acquirer. So restructuring is large, target shrink, acquirers grow. Efficient effect uh, seems to dominate the growth. Now what so we found very striking and interesting is that when you break down net employment into inflows and outflows, you see that when you just look at net employment, you actually miss a lot of the action. So for the, for the merge firm, we see that abnormal, so these are all abnormal flows, so the abnormal inflows is about 10%, and the abnormal outflow is about uh, 70%. Um, and so the outflow is two-thirds by the target and the one third by the acquirer. So overall, turnover is really large. So new hiring is larger than 50% of the separations that we observe in, in restructuring. Now, targets do not have uh, just um, no abnormal inflow. They even have a lower abnormal inflow than you would normally have. So hiring at the target is basically stopped. Right. And all the hiring that happens afterwards is at the acquirer. Right. So to uh, go even one level deeper, uh, let me give you a brief explanation of how our data works and why we can do what we do. So um, just as an example, so this is, um, so on average targets grow by minus 14%. And so the way we observe all firms in our universe, as we observe them in terms of establishments, that we, that we can relate to certain firms. So even uh, when there are ownership changes, legal changes, or anything, so we still know which is establishment is which. So we, even after the acquisition, we still know which of the establishments used to be with the target or with the acquirer. And that allows us to track flows between target and acquirer over time. So establishments can have one, uh, targets can have one establishment, two or many. In this case, just an example, it has two. Same is true for the acquirer. Can we have many establishments? In the example, now it has also two. And now, so the first thing that we looked at is the internal labor, labor market. And s some other studies have done that too. So to just give you an idea of how much is going on, um, 
at the target, not much. So internally, there is somewhat higher turnover uh, at the acquirer, but it's also not large. So the largest flow that you see here is um, a transfer of uh, uh, employees from the target to acquirer. And um, I think that's not too surprising. Maybe the most interesting part about this is that it's 2.2%. So we have quantified that. Um, so we also see later that so there's also a flow from the acquired to target, and that's mostly uh, managers. Now, to, to understand these flows better, let's move out and have a look at the, uh, the, reaction, uh, the interaction with the external labor market. So, and that can be other firms, to, so movements to other establishments, and also to uh, a state where you're not unemployed. So either you are unemployed or in training or anything else that qualifies as that. Now, so from the target to the external labor market to other firms, we have around 8% of the labor force moving. From the acquirer, it's still 3.3%. So, so that is already larger than the transfers here, and that's much larger. Then, so the other large flow that we observe here and definitely much larger than, than so the internal flow here, is the flow from the external labor market into the acquirer. So that's 7% of the labor force basically flowing into the uh, merged firm, in, into the acquirer establishments. And another 2% come from uh, a state where they're not employed. So, the, so um, the first thing that we found very striking is that so the real flows um, I mean, obviously, there will be employment loss, and that will be always with the external labor market. But the real flows also in term of, terms of inflows are coming uh, in interaction with the external labor market. Um, then there are a few minor flows. I'm not going to walk you through all of them, but so lots going on. Um, and that's basically our first takeaway. So um, restructuring is really large, and so what we found most Passing is that turnover is really large. So, and internal labor markets are really small. So the passing part about this is we know that replacing, recruiting employees is very <coughs> costly. Um, so why would you do that? Why not just keep more employees on? So, um, we, so, we, so we try to run with a few hypotheses. And so I already said that we try to build on Levine. And so, um, so one hypothesis that we formulate is that so acquires comparative advantage match them from um, a higher skilled workforce, uh, a more efficiently organized workforce, and a larger management capacity. So that would be the second intangible asset that they bring to the table. And so, and because of that, post-merger restructuring uh, would involve, first of all, building and transferring management capacities. So that would be about internal labor markets. <coughs> and then adapting the composition of the labor force through external turnover. So, and so <coughs> since jobs move to the acquirer and the acquirer has a different organizational setting, uh, higher demands on its labor force, uh, jobs have to be reconfigured. And so what basically we suspect is that now there is this restructuring creates a mismatch between the people that you now have inside the organization that are more or less displaced and the people you actually need for those spots that are filling up within the organization. And as a third and afterthought, actually at the moment in the paper, we also try to show that post-merger restructuring <coughs> increases labor productivity, which is short. OK, so um, now I run you through a second set of results, if that's OK. So the first thing is about whether the, the labor forces between target and acquirer are different. And in fact, they really are. So compared to the target, acquirers work for this much higher skill. So they are more highly qualified. They are less devoted to simple tasks. They are much better educated. And they're also more expensive, so they earn higher wages, which suggests that they have a higher level of productivity. And secondly, so these firms are also more hierarchical. And they have more employees with managerial authority, authority than the targets. So indeed, we see that, so that it's that's fair to argue that acquirers uh, possess skills in this area that the target doesn't have. Now, so what can we say about the transferring and, and uh, building of management capacities? 
Um, so the, the, the chart on the left you have already seen mostly. Um, now, so when you look at management, it's on the right, and so, so basically now you have to, in your mind, compare the left-hand side and the right-hand side. You see that, so for management, there, so the, the, the net employment change actually helps in terms of absolute size, and it's no longer significant, statistically significant. So management, the loss is actually lower, and when you look at inflows and outflows, you realize that, so there's actually a higher level of turnover still. So management is not reduced, but the exchange in management is even larger. And then, so in, in the second part here, down uh, below, you see that so the internal flows also are larger than for the general population of the labor force. So it's really the, uh, the managers who move around within the organization. Now, so uh, we also went to look into more carefully what, uh, what we can say about this turnover and why it exists. So we, we looked into who's <coughs> leaving and who's coming in. Um, and so the first comparison you see here is between the external outflow in the target and the internal external inflow in the acquirer. And there you see that, so first of all, the newcomers, they are better educated. And then secondly, you see that so these newcomers are um, younger and they're also paid less, which is basically because they are younger and less experienced. So there is a, basically a substitution going on where experience is substituted for education. And so the acquirer, there is a somewhat similar picture so the acquirer, remember, has higher levels of education already. So there, um, the differences in terms of education are not really there, but younger people are again filled in. So and that suggests, um, I think we could actually work this more, out more clearly, that so the people that come in, they're not, they not hired to fill the, the top ranks in the organization, but rather the middle ranks of the organization. And so the, the people that are in, they are rather going up the organization. Now, so to, to bring all these things together, what you see on this slide, um, and it's all normalized, so the so numbers are difficult to interpret, so you just have to run with the trends here, is that so that when you look at the composition of the merged firm, labor force, then you see that, um, first of all, educational levels and qualification levels go up, um, age levels go down, and then so, overall wage levels go up, which is interesting because in the earlier slide I've just shown you that actually the people that come in are lower paid than the people that go out. So that effect is entirely driven by those that stay in the firm. Right. And so overall I think it's in line with what we're trying to argue because it suggests that so the productivity of the employees in the firm is increased and such as their wages basically reflecting the increase in productivity. I have four more minutes, so um, I have 30 seconds for this slide, which is fine. So the final part is that and we're currently working on this, so this is still work in progress, we'll, we'll get better. Um, we try to show that these changes also lead to improvements in labor productivity. So the measure that we currently employ is sales over employees. And so we still have to improve uh, the scope of our data set. So this is preliminary evidence, it's called this way. Um, we find that sales growth tends to be positive, um, but it's not as strong. When you look at uh, changes in labor productivity, you see that so basically um, a smaller labor force is, uh, is there set out to produce um, the same output or a, a slightly larger output. In conclusion, and now I have 12 more seconds. Um, stylized fact, overall employment declines. I think, so my take is that uh, from the target, uh, perspective of target, employment really declines dramatically. Turnover increases a lot, even for managers, and most restructuring is uh, through external turnover. So jobs move, but employees do not. Um, 
Acquires have a higher skilled workforce, increase and transfer managerial capaci capacities, and they seem to economize on the labor force by hiring cheaper and younger new employees. And finally, uh, so the post-merger restructuring of the labor force seems to be, those results I actually have shown, driven by industry relatedness in terms of employment decline and human capital relatedness in terms of turnover seems to improve uh, the productivity of the labor force. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for Stefan. <laughs> thanks for Stefan's presentation. Now let's welcome Professor Dirk Ginter from LSE to discuss the paper. Seems to be on. Yeah. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this super interesting paper. Um, Stefan did a fantastic job presenting it. Um, it's, oops. I, oh, that didn't work very well. All right, fair enough. You can see it on the sides. All right. Um, so, this is a paper about labor force restructuring after mergers and acquisitions. German data, which is, I guess, why I'm discussing. Um, <laughs> It's amazing data, genuinely amazing data. Individual level data on both target and acquirer employees. You can see absolutely everything. Who comes, who leaves, who gets moved around, what people earn before or afterwards, everything. I mean, any question you could ask about M&A, pardon me, labor movements after or around an M&A deal, that data set can answer, which is amazing. Um, and the big, I think the main message here is that the changes are very, 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 very large. Um, especially on the target side, which probably isn't as surprising, but actually to a surprising extent, things are also moving on the acquirer side. So on average, we get about a 50% decline in employment at the target. Right? So you kind of now tra tra start to understand why people are so nervous when their company gets acquired. I mean, they have very good reason to be acquired. Now, I'll argue a little bit later that the number is a little bit misleading, even though it's absolutely correct, because it turns out in about 30% of deals, the entire target just gets shut down. So that's behind that. And then in 70% of the deals, nothing much happens. It's actually really, really interesting. So I kind of don't want you to remember that 50% or 55% number because that deal kind of doesn't exist. There are sort of two polar opposite deals here, one where the target just kind of gets wiped out, and then the one where the target workforce is pretty much left alone. So that's actually, I think, really, really interesting. Now, interestingly enough, the acquirers are also growing. Now, ultimately, we need to think about causality, right? Is that because of the deal? Would they have grown anyway? Blah, blah, blah. But we need to think about that. And interestingly, mostly through external hiring. So it's not like they're transferring folks over from the target. They're out there in the market. They're hiring new employees. Um, there is movement of employees, mostly from the target to the acquirer. 18% of target employees. But remember, the acquirers are much larger. So that's only about 4% of the acquirer employees. The opposite movement is much, much smaller, mostly just a bunch of managers. Interestingly enough, lots of churning on both sides, including on the acquirer side. So even though the total number of employees may not change that much, a lot of people get replaced. So people leave, new people come in, take their jobs. Um, how does the paper interpret it? Well, they're looking at this Oliver Levine paper from in the JFE 2017, which I think is called Acquiring Growth. So they have a very specific type of M&A deal in mind. Um, and they're saying, well, look, the acquirers sort of achieve synergies because they're much more efficient. They're getting rid of a bunch of target employees. The acquirers have managerial capacities and skills. The targets are the one with the business and growth opportunities. You put the two together, bang, synergies, riches, etc. All right. My discussion is going to pretty much focus entirely on the interpretation. And I'm basically going to argue that that's a little bit too simple. It's, it's, it's richer. There's a lot more going on. Um, only a small percentage of deals are about acquiring growth or efficiency. There's a lot more going on. So my entire discussion is basically going to be, well, I'm going to try to make three and a half, three points, maybe if I get to the last one, maybe. All right, so I think the big message, if you remember one thing from my discussion, is the deep insights that, well, look, different deals are different. Um, so I think that the paper suffers currently a little bit from sort of the ecological fallacy, where we're looking at the average deal, which I don't think really kind of exists. Right, so just imagine that a third of the deals are apples, a third of oranges, a third of fish. You took at the average deal, you're going to end up with something that's pretty bizarre. Um, and then you're trying to write a model of the average deal, and it's going to not work very well because that average deal doesn't actually make any kind of sense. While each one of the three archetypes do by themselves make an awful lot of sense. Um, is that going to be a little bit mean and sort of really 
kick their proposed models of the Levine model or the, ver the paper's version of the Levine model a little bit, saying, look, even if you take it at face value and look at the average deal, it doesn't sort of kind of really work because, well, they're kind of, I think, looking at the wrong thing. So easy to criticize, right? So then you kind of go like, okay, let's try to be constructive. And then actually you kind of suffer because then you go like, oh, gee, but how should we organize the data, right? So what are these sort of arch types of deals? What are the things we should look at? And I have a bunch of thoughts and I'm grateful I'm not the author. I'm just a discussion who kind of throw out a bunch of thoughts and saying, why don't you try that stuff? It's genuinely really, 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 really difficult. And then if I have time, I'm going to spend 20 seconds pitching about causality. But you can probably write that slide yourself, right? Deals and judgments, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's start with the first thing. Um, so different deals are different. Deals are done for a wide variety of reasons, right? I mean, this is sort of borrowed from my own M&A lectures, economies of scales, economies of scope, facilitating relationships with specific investments, reducing competition, improving management, you name it. Each one of these is gonna have very different implications for the workforce changes. Um, and the average deal, I already said, it might just describe very, very few deals that you actually see out there in the data. And I want to emphasize this is not just some theoretical consideration because I mean, the data is insanely rich and the paper is insanely rich and you can learn so much just by going through the tables. The paper actually shows us that there are at the minimum two completely different deal types out there. In 30% of the deals, the target is completely shut down. This is super interesting. I did not know that. So all the target establishments are just being wiped out. Um, in 70, and they obviously, well, it's the obvious thing, right? The, the target work was kind of gone. Sorry about that. Um, in the other 70% of the deals, very little happens to the target workforce. So just sort of even looking at the average deal here already is completely misleading. The average deal kind of doesn't exist. Let me just show you that in the data. Um, so these are the ones where the target survives. We're not killing the target. And so on the left here, I've got the target. Net employment growth, 3%. It's 3% inflows, nothing in outflows. A few transfers where we're sending a few people from the target to the acquirer. But these are all tiny numbers. Right? There's very, very little going on. All right, and then you look at the one where the target gets closed, and now it gets kind of mechanical, where you go like, well, yeah, it gets wiped out. I mean, that, this is really all this is saying. And don't worry about a minus 160%. This is the scaling done in the paper. So just think of this like everybody is gone. Um, so you kind of look at that and going, well, yeah, I mean, at least two completely different deal types, even just seeing this, looking at the average deal and saying the average deal, 55% of people leave, is like, no, not really, right? I mean, the ones you think about to remember is that, Sometimes we're letting the target survive and you don't actually have to worry that much if you're a target employee or you just get shut down, in which case, well, good luck looking for a job. Um, but honestly, this is just one aspect here, right? Shut down versus not shut down. When you start looking at all these other aspects of who grows, who doesn't grow, who gets transferred, we could probably come up with a bunch of additional deal types as well. Um, and also just sort of thinking in terms of the sort of efficiency notion of we're doing deals because we're really, really efficient. Um, and we're just going to be able to reduce target employment. Well, in seven, I mean, I look at this and I go, I don't think that's the right model, right? Because in 70% of the deals, you explicitly don't do that. And in the 30% of the deals, you just shut down the target. Is that sort of an efficiency story or is there something completely else going on? I'm baffled. Just, I really just want to emphasize at this point. I think we need a slightly different model. Continuing down the same vein, thinking about how the model fits the data or vice versa. Um, one thing the paper looks at a lot, and I like that a lot because that's the stuff I work on myself, uh, manager flows, right? Are we transferring managers? Are we transferring skills? And the paper really emphasizes sort of the acquirer superior managerial skills and skill transfers to the targets. Now, interestingly enough, when you actually look at the flows, they're very much, this is now the average deal once again, right? Of the thing where I said, let's not look at it, but um, that's what we have. So in the average deal, the flows go both directions. And so, the target receives managers from the acquirer that are about 4% of the target's management. When I look the opposite direction, the acquirer receives managers from the target that are also about 4% of now the acquirer. But remember, the acquirer is a lot larger. Right? So at a minimum, if you just count number of managers moving back and forth, it actually the larger movement seems to be the opposite direction. Actually, more managers moving from the target to the acquirer than vice versa. Now, I also want to be Please don't now take away and saying, let's flip the paper around and write a paper saying, oh, it's all about acquiring managerial skills and whatever, moving managerial skills from the target to the acquirer. I sort of want to go back to the basic notion of, no, I think different deals are different. 
Right? Again, there's probably a bunch of deals where this is happening, a bunch of deals where that's happening, and maybe a few deals where it goes both directions. And I think we want to start breaking it down into those different deal types. So the mean slide is done by saying, I think the current model doesn't fit the data very well. And that's just because I don't think there is a model that would fit the data very well because we need multiple models for different kind of deals. Um, so inquirers increase efficiency by reducing employment. Well, in 70% of the deals, no. I mean, they literally just don't do that, right? They're kind of leaving the target uh, employees alone. In 30% of the deals, the targets are just wiped out. Is that an efficiency story? Maybe. It's not the kind of efficiency story that I teach in my M&A class where I've got great skills and I can manage the target assets better. It's more like, no, I just can't put the target. I really would like to understand what's going on behind those deals. What's the story behind that? Why are they doing that? Um, acquirers have and transfer superior managerial skills. Well, in, in the average deal, we actually have more managers moving from the target to the acquirers and vice versa. Uh, but again, I want to emphasize different deals are different here, right? There are probably a bunch of deals where the paper story fits like a glove, absolutely perfectly. And then there are lots of other deals where it doesn't. And by looking at the average, you end up with something that's a bit messy. So that's the easy part, right? Bitching about what other people have done. And then you're trying to be constructive and saying, okay, how, how would I do it? And then it gets really, really difficult. Um, so my idea is now, okay, let's try to classify deals. What would be the deal types I wanted to look at? And ideally in an ex ante manner, right? Where we sort of just put our theory hats on and saying, how would I classify deals? So again, that's a slide I just borrowed from my, from my M&A lecture where I'm trying to say, okay, look, at the minimum there are three types of basic deals, horizontal deals, vertical deals, conglomerate deals. I don't need to explain this to this audience. Um, and the motivations behind those are going to be very, very different and how we achieve synergies are potentially very different. I would expect potentially a lot of employment losses over there, right, because lots of cost savings here. We're combining same with same, probably less in the middle and probably none over there. So maybe that's one way to go. But then was, you think a little bit harder about it and you're going, oh, geez. I mean, they're like, 10 different deal strategies within that category, another 10 here, another 10 there. And again, each one of them is going to be very different. I mean, once you start really start thinking about it, what are all the things going on? Economies of scale, economies of scope, relationship specific investments, improving management, buying technology, relaxing financial constraints, increasing market power, and I probably forgot another 15. Um, and also, it's very difficult to classify deals. Even if we agreed that that was the right list, which it truly isn't, but even if they were the right list, how am I going to classify these? They don't come with a stamp on them saying, oh, this deal is that and that deal is that. And doing this based on observables is a bloody nightmare. So I think what I would do if, if it just were my paper, I would do the thing we're kind of not supposed to do, which is I would totally reverse engineer it. I'm going to just start at the other end and saying, let's just stare at the data. Let's data mine. Um, and try to figure out, are there clusters of deals with very distinct workforce changes? And one big cluster you showed us in the paper, and it's super fascinating, which is the deals in which the targets are shut down, right? This is the 70% versus 30% thing. That's already super useful, and I learned a ton from that. Are there deals with significant workforce expansions or deals with significant workforce reductions in the target, in the acquirer, on both sides? Deals with lots of workforce transfers from the acquirer to the target, target to the acquirer, maybe both ways. Managerial transfers, one way, the other way, both ways. Now, again, there are two dangers here. Number one, this is a bit of data mining. Let's acknowledge that. Number two, the combinatorics here are a little bit daunting. I mean, even counting conservatively, I think I got 13 different deals up here. Um, which you don't want to read that. Nobody wants to read that paper. Um, with some luck, some of these cells are going to be very empty. That's sort of what I'm hoping for. Right, that you're going to find that four or five of these kind of arch types here are going to dominate the data. And you can say something like, look, there are four types of deals out there which capture about 70 or 80% of the deals we see in our sample, and the rest don't worry about. I mean, I think that would be super helpful and super informative. And if you have that, then I just want to know that whatever. 20% of the deals are that, 30% of the deals are that, another 40% are that, and then tell me everything you can about these deals about these deals. So are they horizontal, vertical, conglomerate deals, acquirer characteristics, target characteristics, how the two relate to each other, how the two compare, deal characteristics, and on and on. All right, um, do I have another minute? Yes. Okay, then let me complain about causality. Um, all right, so this is the standard slide. I've had that like in every discussion I've ever given. Um, obviously, all the changes here are relative to set of matched control firms. The paper does a really good job of that with the available data, but obviously, deals and endogenous choices, right? So there's a reason why now that we have two very, very similar looking firms, one of them does a deal, the other one doesn't. 
And that's going to be driven by some unobservable difference between the two firms. So they're going to be different in terms of their profitability, which the paper unfortunately doesn't really observe, growth opportunities, restructuring needs, agency problems, and on and on. So then obviously the danger is always that the changes we see might not be caused by the deal, but uh, by something else. And I think especially that large restructuring on the acquirer side that we're seeing, but you do wonder, is that because of the deal or would that company have restructured anyway? So let me skip the data here because that's sort of just saying there's a lot of restructuring going on on the acquirer side. Again, trying to say something constructive, which is tricky, right? Because it's basically an unresolvable endogeneity problem. We know that, right? We cannot randomize deals. So thank you very much. So can we do anything to give us a sense of how big of a deal it is? Well, some lame ideas. Um, we could look at the year before the deal. But it's kind of like to know, is the acquirer already restructuring massively a year before? In which case, I'd be thinking, well, maybe it's not really caused by the deal. We could look at deals where the target is very small relative to the acquirer. Again, if you see that massive restructuring in the acquirer, maybe it's not really due to the deal. And then the sort of the ambitious bit, if you, have, if you can identify deals that were announced and failed. And we still see a lot of restructuring in the acquirer, again, suggesting there's something else going on. All right, um, quickly wrapping up, it's an amazing documentation of workforce changes on both acquirer and target side. So I think anybody interested in M&A and labor needs to read this paper. And you can just stare at these tables forever. Um, my really only serious suggestion here is try to, as well as you can, to account for the massive heterogeneity in deal strategies. You can do it either in an ex-ante manner, which would in many ways be better, where we're sort of classifying deals based on some theoretical framework, saying let's look for these four different kinds of deals, but it's tricky. Um, maybe, if you can do that in Germany, I genuinely do not know, I tried to research it, I couldn't figure it out. If we have deal synopsis in Germany, like the way we have some in the US, and you could read those, plus you're willing to read a thousand of those, that would be really, really, really useful, right? If you just listen to us, what they're telling us, why they're doing the deal, and if you could classify based on that, that would be amazing. Um, the probably more realistic thing is do it ex post, right? Basically just classify based on what you're seeing with a bit of reverse engineering with all the danger that brings. Thank you very much. Thanks for Dirk's excellent discussion of the paper. Thanks, Dirk. Um, great discussion, I think spot on. Um, so internally we've had these discussions of whether we want to push for narrative or whether we just try to work out um, basically all different deal types that you can imagine. Um, so we have a lot of spreadsheets with a lot of different kind of analysis and sample splits. And I think 95% of what you suggested we have already done at some point. Um, which doesn't mean that we might have to go back to that. So we're currently in the process of revising the paper. And uh, so, so that's certainly, an, uh, I think, a, a good strategy to go with. Um, maybe one point, so we, we're showing in the paper that so whether or not the target closes obviously makes a big difference. But so later on, we're also showing that, so we're distinguishing between related and unrelated transactions. So we're showing that so when you're uh, when it's a horizontal vertical transaction, then employment declines more strongly. So that's in there. But so for other dimensions like turnover, it does not actually matter that much. So and then we're exactly in that problem that you described. So we can, of course, split the target and close, not close, and then we sp split those two samples into horizontal vertical diversifying. And then maybe have another, and then we end up with 50 observations in each bracket. And so. Um, that's a bit of an issue, but so I like very much the idea of a reverse engineer and really make this a descriptive data analytics driven paper. Um, so the, these are certainly the, the lines along we are currently discussing and I think the uh, discussion helps us uh, very much in sorting these discussions out. So thanks a lot. Well, great. We still have uh, some time to take some questions. Hurry. Do you have any information on whether this is voluntary or forced? Uh, and, and can you say something about the quality of the people who come and go? Do you, I don't know how much individual data you have, but are, am I losing my best people or are my best people staying? Um, and, and maybe also, also just, I mean, you have some data on salaries, right? On, so yeah. savings through wage reductions, et cetera. 
because now you're, it's all, uh, a lot of what you presented was about the number of employees. It would be interesting yeah. to look at the wage bill, I guess. So I think we could do more on the question of whether the best people in the target go or leave, uh, uh, stay or leave. Um, I think that would be an interesting angle we could explore more. In general, what we see is that so the uh, acquirer does not really try to replace the leaving employees with employees that look similar. So the, the incoming employees, they are younger, uh, they are paid less well, but they are better educated. So there is a real change in, in, in terms of uh, labor force. Yeah? So, so, the, so I think that so. But is it possible that the acquirer just offered that deal to the ones who are there and say, you take this deal, if you don't take it, you're out, and it will, it will replace you by this deal? I mean, is that possible? That's possible. But I think, so I'm, I'm so the, the question indeed is whether, so these separations are voluntarily or, so who is initiating that? But so the scenario you just described, I think it's either way you put it, not voluntarily. So if, you know, y y your university gets taken over and they say you can have a new job there for half the salary, then probably you leave involuntarily too. Um, so, so I think overall, so I would interpret the evidence is consistent with that. So the the jobs that so the, the jobs that um, that are basically uh, created in the acquirer, uh, they have a different uh, set of uh, required tasks, and so there is this mismatch. Right? So, but we cannot say much about whether these people will internally leave, and then they look for somebody new, or whether this is set out from the beginning like this. Okay, um, I've got a couple of questions, comments. Um, first, I'm wondering if these flows uh, are strongly skewed among different subsamples. Um, uh, and if so, you may want to at least report medians as well as means for uh, some of your analysis. And you may want to look at maybe deciles, at least initially, to make more sense out of which uh, deals maybe are similar uh, to kind of one approach to implementing one of the suggestions that Dirk made. Yeah. Um, I think it might be interesting to try and separate out deals that involve distress targets. Uh, that would be one subsample that may end up being in that group that yeah. everybody disappears uh, in the uh, target. Um, and I think it I would agree w that it makes sense to break the sample into relatively large versus small deals and um, look to see if the findings are similar between those two subsamples. And then I was also not clear how you scaled your flows, but I would think it would make sense to scale them by the pre-deal combined employment of the, uh, the two firms that are uh, involved in the deal. And finally, I think it'd be interesting to control for geographic distance between the acquirer and the target. And are the flows different when there's a short distance versus a long distance between the two uh, deal partners? Thanks. So um, regarding skewness, there's certainly skewness. I think that um, can already be like, uh, concluded from the fact that so the, the flows are much stronger when there is closure, right? Um, so the geographic proximity matters. We actually have the data, and so obviously, so the so, so flows depend on that. Um, the question is, how do you factor in that in in, in our paper? But so so I, I, it's a, it's a it's a dimension that matters. Um, and so the the flows are all scaled by the. Um, Total employment, um, but so it's scaled over basically the start and the end date of the observation period because this is basically the, the methodological logic of uh, of the papers in that area. Um, but we could redo this um, uh, how you suggested that it would just open up another box of problems, uh, solving another one. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Great. Uh, let's take the last question probably because the time is. Of course. 
Um, so, Alan Giles, I'm a practitioner, not an academic. But just um, reverse engineering, one of the things you might look at is those instances in which you've had an influx from outside the two organizations. And in my experience of uh, managing mergers between close competitors, what often happens is both the target company and the acquired company, the employees of both companies feel they've been taken over. So they feel there's a sort of cultural uh, overcarry from the other organization. And one of the ways you remedy that as a manager is by trying to bring in management from outside of either organization so that you're observing a neutrality. So that's just a possible hypothesis for when you're reverse engineering that group. Okay, great. Because the time is limited, I think we can conclude the session. Thanks for all the speakers. Thanks for all the comments. Uh, yeah, excellent presentations as well as everyone's engaged discussions. Saying now, let's uh, have a break and come back at 3:30. Thanks, everyone.